This is The Crucible. The JRTC Experience. This is where we discuss warfighting skills and lessons learned in a decisive action training environment for large-scale combat operations at JRTC. Hi, I'm Colonel Matt Hardman, the Commander of Operations Group here at the Joint Readiness Training Center, and thanks for joining us for another episode of the Crucible, the JRTC Experience. Today, we're fortunate to be joined by uh, two of our company uh, OCTs, uh, both of them uh, 10th Mountain alumni. If you'd introduce yourself and tell us like where you're from and a little bit about you. Yes, sir. Captain Richie Dom, Charlie One Zero. I walk with Alpha Companies Task Force One. I grew up as an Army brat, lived in a lot of different places, primarily Fort Bragg and Northern Virginia when my dad was at the Pentagon. I went to Virginia Tech, was in the Corps of Cadets with our mutual friend Connor Delaney. Right. <laughs> I have served in 10th Mountain Division 431 as a platoon leader. Uh, we served together in Afghanistan almost a couple years ago to the day, sir. And Triple C graduate, and now I'm down here working as a company OCT. Okay, and, and what, what do we think? What do we think ne is next for you? Command over in Geronimo, sir. Uh, command over in Geronimo, right? Sir, uh, Captain K. Ellison, Lima Seven Zero, coming down on the distribution company uh, for the Brigade Support Battalion. I grew up in Minnesota. Uh, my last few assignments, I was a hotel FSC company commander for 431 2nd Brigade, 10th Mountain Division. Uh, also served during non-combatant evacuation operations in Afghanistan two years ago, sir. <laughs> uh, before that, I was a HHC uh, Brigade Support Battalion Company Commander, and uh, as a lieutenant, served in the 1st Armored Division Sustainable Brigade, sir. So I've got a little bit of different, little experiences, bit of different experiences as a logistician. All right, and what previous jobs have you had here? Uh, I was a FSCOCT for Task Force One for a year. Uh, got nine good rotations in, lots of lessons learned. And then now over to the VSB. Absolutely, sir. Right, awesome. Okay, hey, Sue, so, um, what have you learned about large-scale combat operations? I mean, e each of you, you got like five or six rotations now, six, is that sir. right? And you've got 10, is that right? Yes, sir. What have you learned about large-scale combat operations? Sir, uh, for, for low distitions, uh, there's two different sports, really. In Garrison, we do really static support. So you think, think about distribution platoons supporting a light infantry battalion at a range. They're using their cell phone to coordinate. Uh, there's not any requirement to really forecast, get any log stats, or synchronize, establish security. So that, that that's very simple uh, logistics task. When units come down to JRTC, they're challenged with understanding the requirements, which are much more complex than what they're used to at home station. Uh, understanding their capabilities uh, holistically, not only internal to their formation, uh, but at the next echelon of sustainment, uh, and then synchronizing that in time and space using MTO communications platforms, so JBCP, FM comms, um, and then ensuring that it's synchronized with the maneuver plan. Um, right. All that is like easier said than done, yes, right? Sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, basic uh, point there, sir, is that sustainment units need to break out of the mold of being fine with day-to-day -day garrison operations. They yeah. have to take the risk of being slightly less effective in supporting uh, their units, taking the risk of requiring uh, convoys to actually rely on M2 communications platforms and actually do link up with the supported units, uh, establish security. Um, Lieutenant Colonel James Hubbard over at National Training Center, uh, he's written extensively about yeah. this. That there's a big difference between how sustainment units fight in garrison and how we fight when we have to yeah. fight in a list of simulated environments. Right, right. And, and good units, frankly, do multi echelon training and they practice this stuff as often as possible at home station before they come here and, and do it at, at game speed. Yes, sir. Yeah, but, what about, I'm sorry. But it requires a, a deliberate uh, system, it requires a, a culture change within the brigade combat team. And it requires brigade support battalion commanders to articulate to the brigade commander that sir, we're going to be a little bit less efficient in supporting our battalions initially until yeah. we set up the, these uh, systems. Yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, you know, as a battalion commander, as a brigade commander, you know, 
we, we have some challenges with maintenance and the first instinct is, well, let's just do it in the bays. But the reality is our organizations are built to do this in a field environment. And uh, you know, the crazy thing, what I, what I learned over time was actually we end up doing better maintenance for in the field, right? Because yeah. everybody's there and everybody's focused. <laughs> exactly. What, do you, what have you learned about large scale combat operations? I think like you said earlier, sir, just the larger echelons and how they communicate with each other. Uh, one of the issues that I've seen for each of those rotations that we've done is how hard it is to have an uh, up-to-date common operational picture and know where units are in space and time, whether it's within your organization, your battalion, or as a brigade, you know, the question's always, where's the squadron? What's the squadron doing out in front? And then you're- Well, that sounded like really accusatory about the squadron. Like the squadron's out there, like, you know, it's a, the squadron's like the bad teenager, right? Out there, it's past curfew doing, uh, it's well, hard. Roger, sir. <laughs> they're, they're out there trying to give you the information that you need and seeing where the enemy is, but just knowing where they are and as they maneuver through their reconnaissance process, yeah. having the up-to-date location of where yeah. they are, Primarily, so you can clear fires. Right. Fires are huge. Um, I think of large-scale combat operations and combined arms. It's, you need to have it. So your ability to protect yourself with fires and lead with HE moving up to the objective, yeah. you have to have that common operational picture if you're going to do that. Right, so. and that all starts with, I mean, it's, it's true in the, in the uh, support area as well. I mean, it's having really clear graphics that are, frankly, controlling, right? It's like, from this point, this unit has responsibility for this piece of ground. On this side of that line, this unit has responsibility for this piece of ground. Roger, sir. Colonel Ginty, Charlie Six, he always talks about how boundaries are permissive. So you get your area that you get to operate in and you own it. And if you cross into somebody else's or they cross into yours, it's a forcing function to communicate, understand where they're at. Right. It should be, should sir. Should be. That's how we want it to be. Roger, right. sir. What, what else have you kind of learned? I mean, what, as you reflect back on your own experiences, you know, what have you learned about the next echelon, right? So uh, served as a company commander, getting ready to serve as a company commander. What have you learned about battalions uh, based on your experience here? I think the staffs need those reps to work together and produce good products that the companies can fight off of. Right. A lot of times we're doing a rapid decision-making process as opposed to deliberate MDMP with how quickly the environment changes, sir. Yeah. So companies aren't getting as refined yeah. of products. And just having a set tax op is huge, sir. Hey, these are the things that we absolutely need to produce. Having the people assigned to those certain things, finding the balance between your current operations and your future operations so you don't have a lag during those transition periods and just how big that is for the company commanders to get that workable product. Right, and you know, we can't do RDSP until we've done MDMP, right? I mean, RDSP is really, we're trying to make a decision that we hadn't captured in our DSM, but it's the, the foundation for that is actually the analysis that came out of MDMP. Um, you know, do you appreciate battalion headquarters now maybe more than you did when you were like a platoon leader or company XO? <laughs> Yes, sir. It's always the catch-all that higher headquarters is messed right. up in this part. But I try to frame it as I'm walking down with the companies, and we feel like we're fighting off of not complete information. We don't know the, the injects and the fights that the brigade is making, and maybe you had thrown them a curveball coming from the division level, and they have to solve this usually problem. Usually not. Uh, usually not. Usually, it's not the division. Impo it's uh, it's hard, right? I mean, it's a, there's a there's a lot of variables even at the battalion and, and at the brigade level. Um, but I mean, I think that perspective we, we may not really be empathetic to what's happening at the mm -hmm. battalion and the brigade level is pretty huge. What have you seen where uh, companies make problems for battalions? Not being proactive, sir. So the parallel planning planning process is huge. Companies should be working their TLPs while the battalions and brigades are working their MDMP. But if companies just sit back and try to wait for the full order. Wait, wait for the word. <laughs> wait for the word. <laughs> right. You know, that's another reason if you have the tax op and you have a general idea, hey, we're going to do a movement to contact or we're going to do an attack, you already have an idea of what you're doing and what rehearsals you need to be doing. So the commanders can be working on those plans, asking questions of battalions, hey, what are, you know, 
what are we doing, like when are we going, having the timelines is huge. But if you just sit back and become reactive, then you're ultimately not going to achieve the level of detail yeah. and planning that you should be. Yeah, you'll end up being the, the trail platoon of the trail company of the trail battalion in the division run, right? getting whip, whipsawed around. Uh, what, about, what about you? So uh, definitely log stats. So <laughs> obviously uh, for maneuver battalions, it's, it's very obvious that companies main log stats are the battalion S4s that are accurate and timely help be the battalion log cop and ultimately the brigade log cop. Uh, but for sustainers specifically, um, effort for support companies and the distribution company, them providing accurate log stats to the, the BSB SPO, they help drive consumption rates so that ultimately logisticians aren't quite as reliant on those log stats from the infantry guys. They can focus a little bit more on war fighting and sustainers can use their ability to forecast um, so that they're more focused on synchronizing their sustainment with maneuver as opposed to passively waiting on log stats to be received. Yeah, but you know, the log stats, like, they gotta be accurate. They, they do, sir. <laughs> but I mean, logisticians do have the ability to, to forecast once they've got that baseline yep. consumption data. I've seen too many units come here and say, oh, I haven't received log stats, so I'm not gonna push a statement, and that's right. the wrong answer. No, absolutely. Yeah, it's um, the, uh, the guy, I think, you know, what I've seen is like, logisticians have to really insert themselves in the process, and the maneuverers have to pull them into it and be like, okay, hey, this is where we think we're at. I mean, we're not that perfect. We've got to be close, right? Uh, both in our lock stats as well as in our forecasting kind of going forward. Uh, yes, sir, at the battalion yeah. level, it's, it's really defined the roles and responsibilities of the battalion S4 and the FSC commander, uh, especially since the FSC commander, they can't be everywhere. They can't be at the combat trains command post and the field trains command post right. back at the base. Doctrinally, where are they supposed to be? There's different answers to doctrine, that right. that's the thing, sir. And so I think what the battalion S4 can do working out of the battalion main is he can really understand requirements. He can understand yeah. the maneuver plan. And if he can synchronize that with the FC commander who can apply the capabilities to the requirements, yeah. uh, then it can be synchronized with the maneuver. Yeah, okay. I, I would submit FSC commanders should be in the field trains command post, which is in the BSA, yes, sir. right? Best communications platform for sustainment, access to all the key leaders, right? And then HAC commanders running the combat trains command post um, is, is I think generally the, the best way to spread the, the C2 across. It's, it's sort of interesting, but that's all grown up work, right? I mean, field trains command post, CTCP, I mean, this, this is how we sustain battalions and ultimately like the brigade, right? The brigade, if a battalion isn't C2 in sustainment, Ultimately, it's not just that battalion that will suffer, right? I and mean, we see how these problems don't stay localized in one battalion. Yes, sir, absolutely. What have you seen about, um, you know, now that you're over with the BSB, I mean, what have you learned about that, um, really the, the operation of, of a BSB that maybe is a little different from the perspective you had when you were a company commander? Well, it's just the, the level of complexity to coordinate with the CSSB for resupply um, as well as coordinating resupply to the four support companies. And it's up a, to the division. And up to the division, yeah. sir. It's a, it's a lot of data that has to be rapidly uh, received, assessed, and and ultimately executed, sir. Um, and if, if those systems and processes are not established prior to coming to JRTC, uh, the unit will be 72 hours behind the power curve. Yeah, to take a, take a minute to catch up. Um, I'm going to stick on the sustainment for a minute because like one of the things that we've been able to see um, I think three or four times so far is BSA based cluster versus the, the giant massive um, BSAs of the past. What, what, had, had you ever executed a base cluster as a company commander? I, I had not, sir. I okay. always did the the typical Taj Mahal of a yeah. brigade support area. So what have been some of the advantages and then what are some of the things that we're really having to learn as, as we do base clusters? Uh, the big thing with base clusters, sir, is the, the communications piece. So I, I know I've seen the 82nd execute base cluster operations. It is absolutely the way we have to go to, to secure our sustainment nodes uh, as we prepare for near peer fights. Uh, however, we have to ensure that we're trained on our communications platforms yeah. and, and have those lines of communication between the forest support companies and the distribution company and the brigade support battalion. Uh, I've seen forest support companies driving around good old Geronimo DZ looking for uh, the map P, yeah. uh, water points, et cetera. So that desynchronizes sustainment as well. So it's 
it's a balancing act sort of between synchronizing sustainment but also securing sustainment. Yeah. Being survivable. Yeah. And then, the, you know, the terrain management challenges are different with a base cluster. I mean, on one hand, we can, more terrain is, you know, if I don't have to put 500 people in one spot, I've only got to put 120. I, I got more options of where I can put stuff. But what are some of the challenges from the terrain management standpoint that you've seen? Well, in terms of securing those base clusters, sure. Yeah. So uh, most BSBs have very few convoy protection platforms. Yeah. Uh, and also in terms of MTO communications equipment, very limited, uh, as well as soldiers who are less trained on yeah. uh, FM radios and JVCP. So the ability to effectively secure those base clusters is, is pretty limited. Sir. Yeah, it means we can't afford to ha not have any of our equipment working we can't afford to not have people trained on these things, right? In the past, you probably could get away with having a couple systems and a couple operators and that would be okay. And now it's sort of like, we really gotta have higher premium on everybody being able to use their equipment. All right, what, what have you learned about, um, you know, watching the interaction of company commanders with battalion level field grades? I mean, what are some of the things that you've taken away that are in your kit bag as you go forward and do this as a company? Well, it's a it's a team effort, sir. So, in the military, of course, we have our rigid rank structure, and in garrison, it's you know, sir, ma'am, all that kind of stuff. And we're still doing that in the field, but it's just much more of a team. Like the field grades are like, hey, man, I need you to do this. Like I need help, just as the commanders are asking battalion that we need help. Um, the biggest piece I think that commanders can provide to those field grades is the bottom-up refinement. Yeah. So another thing that Colonel Ginty said is that the primary information gatherers for the battalion should be the companies. You know, instead of trying to get it from your ISR platforms for brigade or from the squadron, what the companies see up there as far as the bottom-up refinement can really help inform that yeah. battalion plan. And then it's just that teamwork all coming together, sir. Yeah. I mean, I think the the you know large-scale combat operations, right? Like all those ISR platforms that we maybe some of us from our experiences in Afghanistan and Iraq, those are, those are working for the division and above. I mean, Gray Eagle uh, is working for division above. Attack aviation is generally going to be, not always, but generally going to be working for the division. And so, and even Shadow, Shadow is going to be flying for the brigade. Um, so we, the sensors that we have, whether it's a ground observer, whether it's a Hornet, whether it's a Raven, like we really got to make the most of those sensors that we've put with companies uh, forward. And then, you know, it's the assessments. I mean, it's not just the raw data, it's the assessments from commanders. Um, but I did like how you, you know, this team sport, you know, how do companies help the battalion and the brigade succeed? Right, and I think oftentimes we think about how our brigades and battalions helping companies, but that when you flip, it's both ways. When we flip it around, and companies are like anticipating and thinking through the things they have to do to help the battalion and the brigade be successful. How what have you seen with that? So, right, specific to for support company commanders, they really need to insert themselves into the MDM pro, MDMB process a level that uh, other line company commanders. Uh, don't need to do right, right. because they are the senior logistician for their battalion. Right. So they're able to uh, understand their capabilities and their limitations. And as they go through the MDMP process and understand the requirements better, they can synchronize their sustainment plan with maneuver and articulate it clearly to their battalion well before LD. Right. I've seen many FC commanders avoid MDMP. Uh, the battalion S4 is the only one really going through all the MDMP Yeah, sessions. I was a battalion S4. I wasn't that awesome at it. <laughs> <laughs> and then ultimately there's a disconnect not only between the battalion S4 and the FSC commander, but obviously uh, between the FSC yeah. and their support battalion. And You know, it's funny, you just took me back in the Wayback Machine. My FSC commander, she's a rock star, uh, Major uh, Sarah Johnson. You know, we had a, a home station training, had a, a, she was very unhappy with what she was getting from the battalion. I'm like, hey, if you want a better concept of support, how about you help build the concept of support? And uh, when we came here, I didn't have a single sustainment problem, um, you know, because she had inserted herself in that process and, and, and also had a pretty, pretty awesome HAC commander in, uh, in Chris Dispinay that, you know, the two of them working together kind of kept us all on track and moving in the right direction. But it's not being afraid of it, you know, it's like turning into it and helping it. Um, 
it leadership wise, like what have you, you know, you've gotten to watch a lot of majors here, right? Whether it's it's with the, the battalions that you're working with from rotational training unit or from, uh, you know, really the task forces. What have, what have you learned about uh, the attributes for field grade leadership? I think you need to be open-minded, sir, because like we said, receiving that bottom-up feedback from the companies, like, hey, sir, this is what we're seeing on the ground, and that's how the adjustment to the plan can come. But at home station, the battalions pretty much produce the plan, and then the companies go and execute it, and there isn't as much of the need for that bottom-up refinement as there is with the thinking enemy here at JRTC. So just being open to, okay, you're seeing this, so we need to adjust our plan a little bit, attack from a different direction, yeah. and just, once again, sort of that teamwork portion of it and yeah. just ability to adapt. I think, you know, one of the things that, that uh, we struggle with, and it, it somewhat gets back to what you were saying about the way FSCs, their support units tend to operate at home station. I think we tend to do this with our staffs too is it's not disciplined. I mean, we think it's, it's rigid, but it's not disciplined at home station oftentimes. And so it's, you know, do we do a conditions check? Is that part of what we do at the battalion level? Do we do confirmation briefs? Do we do back briefs? Do we require um, bottom-up refinement of graphics with a, a specified cutoff time? Do, do we require target refinement cutoff with a specified time? Because that input is it's essential incidentally it's kind of built into the mdmp process but if it's not disciplined it's hugely disruptive because it ends up being reactive and it ends up we make adjustments but the adjustments happen too late and we can't actually feed them back in and so you know it's the discipline of telling company commanders confirmation brief hey if you got to come armed with your kind of running estimate of your formation back brief you got to come with hey this is how i see the risk um, but I do, you know, think it's, you know, it's exactly kind of you describe. Like we can't have majors that are like, hey, this is the plan, and it's just going to happen regardless of how the enemies change or combat power in a company's changed, right? Uh, sometimes we have a tendency to do that. What about your perspective? What Sir, I absolutely concur with what Richie just said. Um, yeah. So it's it's those majors who are able to provide that that top down structure that's flexible enough to allow that bottom up feedback where company commanders feel that they're their feedback, their expert feedback on the ground, it's going to be uh, basically consolidated battalion and, and synchronized to provide, uh, you know, synchronized combined arms maneuver. Yeah. Um, a lot of times, majors go either one way or the other where right. they are too rigid and the company commanders feel that their feedback is, is useless and uh, so they, they don't provide it, so the battalion's losing that, that feedback. Or they're sort of the figurehead and <laughs> not really providing any structure right, to, given to the battalion. Here's a whiteboard. Tell us, you know, how you want to self-actualize. Exactly. Right? No, no systems and process, no yeah. discipline um, that the unit can iterate on and improve. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I think that's you know the the one extreme of like, hey, companies, tell us what you want to do. Like combined arms maneuver by committee doesn't work. But then also, you know, we don't need the we don't need the commissars that are like, this is the plan, and there's no, you know, your input and feedback are. Are not only not required but aren't appreciated <laughs> it isn't particularly helpful sure and being able to balance all the different elements that go into it so yeah. we've used the term combined arms a couple different times so you have to be able to take your ground maneuver infantrymen and then your indirect fires plan to field artillery your engineers oftentimes with the breach any sort of electronic warfare assets you have to be able to make sure that all of those things are being balanced and then of course the logistics that drive all yeah. of those things so you can't just be thinking about one thing. What what about control, right? So it's like sort of a dirty word at times in our army, even though it's a it's part of a war fighting function. I mean, what what's your what's your view on control? Has do you appreciate that maybe there's a need for more control? I think it always depends on what the mission is, sir. Um, so having the control of the friction points between the different units, yeah. whether it's two companies yeah. conducting an F pole or something yeah, like anytime that. Anytime two companies touch, right? Like there's friction. Roger serve. Yeah. But also you have to understand when to exert that control because if you do give them boundaries and clearly articulate what you want your end state to be and the company's working through that within their boundaries, sometimes 
if you put too much control in there, it can disrupt the operation that they have on the ground. And it goes back to just understanding the feedback from the ground, like Katie was saying with the eyes on, sir. Sir, absolutely, in, in terms of understanding, shared understanding of triggers. Um, right. So if there's not a shared understanding of triggers and ability to uh, control uh, what's happening on the ground based off that, that bottom-up feedback, then obviously uh, desynchronization across all war and fine more fine functions will result. Um, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, I the uh, you know part part you know the number one kind of thing that helps us have a degree of control is like graphics, you know, above above kind of everything else. Like if if we get if we're attacking an objective as a battalion, and we have clear graphic control measures, um, then it gets pretty easy. Even when things start to get frictionous, we start to have communications challenges. When we don't have those clear graphics, I think what we end up with oftentimes is actually a failure to act because there's this hesitation because we don't really understand where everybody else is in the fight and space and time. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a counterintuitive, like when we exert greater control up front, it actually, it creates that freedom because it becomes permissive. It's like, okay, hey, this is my left and right boundary. These are the phase lines. I understand the triggers that the tie to fires, tie to sustainment, tie to the actions of people on my left and right. And as long as I'm operating within that, this thing will actually probably be pretty synchronized. But if I'm not, or I don't appreciate the impact of my actions or interactions on adjacent units or a different warfighting function, then that's where it starts to kind of unravel. Um, but I think what kind of both of you have said in here is it's like that bottom-up refinement. It's like, okay, you can tell a company, hey, you need to, to walk 10 kilometers in the next six hours. But when the company come here and tell, comes back to you and says, like, there's no way. Like, I've been in this terrain. Like, I need eight hours to do that, not six. That happens frequently. Right, right. We a lot of hope, uh, you know, to, to cover that kind of distance for sure. Um, Hey, what do you hope to get out of the, your remaining time here in operations group as an OCT? What do you, what do you, you know, if there were two or three things you're like, hey, I really want to learn about these things in my time here, what would they be? I think a lot of the sustainment piece, sir, that goes into. Oh, that's like really polite. She's like right we, here. You got a friend, a former, <laughs> former polar bear with you. Roger, sir, just how that feeds into the companies. A lot yeah. of guys that don't get love during JRTC are the company XOs. We talk a lot with the commanders, platoon leaders, platoon sergeants of their role in it. Yeah. But we don't specifically. That's um, good feedback. I had never heard that. And I like actually have a soft spot in my heart for company XOs. I think company XOs are like amazing. Right, sure. They don't get a whole lot of the AAR feedback. Yeah. Um, so. All right. That's a good piece. And I think how to properly use your reconnaissance assets. Yeah. A lot of times reconnaissance don't get specific task and purpose where they kind of get forgotten because the scout platoon leader isn't tied in with the two and the three advocating for what they can do for the battalion and right. the companies. So how to properly use them out in front of the fight, sir? Yeah. Um, I think we got to expand that though. I, I think it's also the, to your earlier point, um, you know, how are, how are companies collecting and are we tasking them to collect on behalf of the battalion? Right? whether it's with a Raven, whether it's with a squad conducting a patrol. Um, a, an infantry squad can, do, can go establish an OP overwatching an AI, right? Um, you know, the scout, the reconnaissance platoons, um, you know, I was really fortunate. I had an AS3 that had been a, a recon platoon leader um, in second range of battalion, phenomenal officer. And I learned a ton from him. Um, and part of it was do less but do it really well. You know, don't ask a, a, a reconnaissance platoon to conduct zone reconnaissance and then look at like five or six different NAIs. Um, th that doesn't work well because um, they need time to get into position. They need time to be established, to get communications up, to actually observe kind of what they're doing. And um, you know, I think doing less better, uh, but being pretty directive about what what we what are the information requirements we have to have, actually have to answer. I think that's. Those are good ones, and, and hopefully, you know, I think we've seen a lot of growth here in the last year with 
uh, ground reconnaissance tied with small UAS tied with SIGINT EW teams uh, being pretty lethal when they're tied in with fire. So hopefully, uh, one, we get to see a little bit more of that while you're still in OCT, and you better be doing that when you're a company commander for Drivo. <laughs> Absolutely, sir. Um, and the company X XO one's really interesting because I think that's, were you a company XO? Yes, sir. Uh, were you ever a company XO? Yes, sir. I was a company XO. I, that job for me was, uh, that's where I just, I learned a ton about how to be a company commander um, based off that experience. I mean, that was a hugely developmental job. But I, I do get your perspective that maybe we don't give them an, enough attention and love here. And maybe we got to spend some time talking with them. So cool. All right, what about you? Sir, so, I really want to understand the, the best practices for SPO, BSB SPO integration with the DSSB SPO and then the relationship with the Brigade 4. And this is why Lieutenant Colonel Roy <laughs> moved you over to Lima team. <laughs> yes, sir. We're super excited to have you over there. Because I, I do see the Brigade S4 uh, and the BCT and the BSB SPO often either overlapping uh, roles and responsibilities yeah. or and sort of doing each other's work in, yeah. in, a, in a vacuum and, and never really synchronizing. Um, or they are basically leaving a lot of sustainment forecasting and tying in with brigade uh, scheme maneuver undone. So, and then of course that synchronization with the CSSB, DSSB, uh, is, it's a recurring problem every rotation. So I'd like to figure out what that, that best practice is. Um, I haven't quite figured it out, sir. Um, the other piece is class four uh, <coughs> defense. So every single rotation, there's a, a shortfall with getting the engineer planners brought in with the sustainment planners to build the right CCLs and then doing the, the math of when are we going to use CSSB assets or ELF company in the BSB assets to move those class four flat racks to the engineer support areas and then ultimately exactly where the industry companies need uh, yeah. to, to build. Yeah, and I would, I would actually argue, I mean, I think... Um, you know, the reality is we're probably more generous with division sustainment resources to the brigades than, than what we'll actually be able to do. That, that's absolutely right, sir, because you think about it, the, the DSSB, they're supporting three brigade combat teams. Right. And, so and the division eats first. <laughs> exactly, sir. Right. And it's not realistic that the CSSB is doing daily log packs to one. No, and I mean, context. and we give the CSSB missions for the 21st Airborne Division that uh, aren't just uh, the brigade that's in the box, but they probably get more support than they would really get. Yes, sir. Um, especially because, we, you know, we assume there'll probably be more units attached to the division than, than just what's organic to the division. So, no, I think those are great, and, and that's actually, you know, why you're there. Um, you know, I think everybody sees that you're a future future brigade SPO out there and got a bright future. Okay, uh, closing comments or, co or questions for me? Uh, sir, what would you say are the two traits you'd want from a, a BSB SPO serving your formation as a former brigade commander? Ooh, that's a good one. I, I think, so I think the first one, um, predict and prevent problems, right? So at the, at the captain level, it's identify and solve problems. At the, at the brigade level and above, I think it's gotta be predict and prevent, right? And so it's being able to look, um, you know, in a tactical environment um, out into the future and say, okay, that's gonna be a problem and here's the things that we gotta do right now uh, to prevent that thing from ever being a problem, right? You know, General Beagle would talk about this, and it's like, it's, it's preventing the train wreck from happening. And I think that takes a lot of, of knowledge. I think it takes experience, but I think it takes a mindfulness about like, okay, pick up head and look 48, 72 hours in the future and be like, mm, based off what I've seen in the past, like this is probably gonna be a fair bit of friction and here's the things I can do right now um, to get in front of that problem and keep it from ever happening. And so I think that's the, I think that's really the big one. And then I think in, in home station and garrison, it's looking at the long range train calendar and being like, hey, this, there'll be competing requirements all at the same time. How do I simplify that problem for everybody so, so we don't have you know, a train wreck? I think that's the first one is predict and prevent problems. Um, I think this, you know, the second one 
is it's it's a very you know sustainment's a very systems based thing, uh, processes and systems, and I think really really good majors, regardless of of branch, mentor and develop subordinates to run those systems. Um, they create an environment where non commissioned officers uh, have a seat at the table that we demand that non commissioned officers um, help run those processes and systems, and we give them. Uh, the opportunity to do that uh, when when we can we can fix things right so allowing staff sergeants to do stuff and be responsible for things um, but with enough space that it it never becomes catastrophic if they make a mistake it's like okay hey that was pretty good here's where it came up short do it again do it. so then when we get to high end training like we're completely comfortable letting a staff sergeant you know an assistant uh, do a bunch of things. Likewise with our captains, is having very high expectations of our junior officers, but creating an environment where we give them the opportunity to make some mistakes, improve, make a few more mistakes, improve, and then all of a sudden it's like, hey, you're amazing at this, go out and conquer. Um, and I think when we have organizations that are led by field grades that do that, we're a lot more efficient, we're a lot more effective, and frankly, it's a ton of more fun to be in an organization like that. So those would be the two things I would say I would, I'd be looking for. All right, what about you? You got any questions for me? Sir, I know you're working on putting out a reading list, but right. if you were to back up in my shoes, pre-command, pre-field grade, staff officer, what would your direction of study be now uh, going into that, sir? So I think the first thing is I think you should, like, reading intellectual fitness is no different than like physical fitness like what you put in what you do will kind of determine the output <clears throat> and so you know don't don't put junk food uh, into your into your body uh, don't put junk into your brain um, challenge yourself like read hard things read things that are, are uncomfortable and challenging I don't think it all has to be like I'm a historian I don't think it has to all be history uh, but I think I think you should approach stuff with rigor, um, and I think um, I think that you know that that's kind of a, a, a good philosophical rule about things. Um, you know that we want to learn from other people's mistakes, not our own mistakes, um, or and successes, right? And so, you know, I think uh, reading about war fighting is I think important in our profession. Um, I think to get a perspective one and two levels up from where you currently are is hugely important. You know, when, when you can think about the things that battalion and brigade commanders are thinking about as a company commander, you'll be a better company commander. And it's not about making your boss happy. It's about helping one and two levels up those organizations succeed. There's a virtual cycle in this, right? When companies help battalions and brigades, battalions and brigades are better able to help companies, right? And we're all, as you said kind of earlier, we're all in this together. We're all on a team together. You know, I'll go back to, to that, you know, um, majors have an outsized impact on the development of lieutenants and captains. And really, really good majors uh, make the battalions are in fun to be a part of and, and a fun place to learn. And I was, I was super blessed, you know, I, the, you know, Major Brown, and, and Major Williams, when I was a, a company XO, uh, spent a ton of time developing me. Um, you know, Major Toner, uh, Chris Toner was my battalion XO at the National Training Center. I'll never forget that sort of experience, uh, singing Staying Alive with him at two in the morning uh, in the Valley of Death. And so, you know, I think good majors help create that environment. Good majors like help uh, guide lieutenants and captains with kind of their self-study and self-development, like the three pillars of leader development. We have uh, 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 institutional, so our PME, uh, operational, being in a unit, and I think the, the jobs that we have in, in battalions and brigades, um, most of those jobs are supervised by major, right, additional duties. And so I think good majors help guide people through that, and then I think they help lieutenants and captains in particular with their self-development say hey you got some gaps here uh, how do you work on those things so specifically to sort of what you're asking um, you know I think um, some some easy ones so I think one is if you've never read uh, Strunk and White the Elements of Style about writing and communication it's a book you should read and you should look at and you should reference because becoming a good writer takes a lot of practice and time and 
it may not be essential to what you're doing as a captain, but it will be pretty important uh, to you as a major um, and your ability to communicate clearly. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, one book, and we talked about here, is uh, No Picnic, Battle for the Falklands. Uh, it's a brigade perspective on that campaign. It's expeditionary, it's austere, it's combined arms uh, against a near peer adversary for the British in, in the Falklands campaign. And I think for me, I've read that book a couple times and it's just helped to sharpen my thinking about what will large scale combat operations, what could it potentially look like? Um, I think above all else is just being really curious. It's being curious about the things that maybe you're not quite as good at yet. Um, and I tend to read in batches. That's how I, I generally read. I'll pick four or five books on a subject and I'll read them that have a different perspective. And so I think having a, an approach to how you read. Now, I'll also confess, you know, I'll read a detective every novel, novel every now and again because I think it's important to, to let your brain um, be creative and, and think and imagine. And I think that that's kind of part of it too. So, um, yeah, and I owe a book list. All right. Thanks. Appreciate y'all joining us. Thank you for joining us on The Crucible, the JRTC experience. The Joint Readiness Training Center is the premier crucible training experience. We prepare units to fight and win in the most complex environments against world-class opposing forces. We are America's leadership laboratory. Again, we'd like to thank our guests for participating. This podcast was created and produced by Mr. John Mabes. It was recorded and edited by Chief Thomas Rich and researched by First Lieutenant Anthony Cho. Intro vocals were done by Mr. Robert Chopper. Special thanks to Captain Jermaine Branch and Mr. Jeff England from Public Affairs. Be sure to like and follow us on social media to keep up with the latest warfighting TTPs learned through the crucible that is the Joint Readiness Training Center. Follow us by going to https colon forward slash forward slash linktr dot ee forward slash jrtc. We'd like to thank our partners at the Center for Army Lessons Learned of the Combined Arms Center, especially the JRTC Call Observations Detachment. Be sure to follow them on social media as well. Follow them at https colon forward slash forward slash www.army.mil forward slash C-A-L-L. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and review us wherever you listen or watch your podcasts, and be sure to stay tuned for more in the near future. The Crucible, the JRTC experience, is a product of the Joint Readiness Training Center.